Welcome everybody to today's webcast on being a product counsel, even if you're not technical. This is Bob Ambrogi. Uh, I am a tech columnist at Above the Law, and I'm going to be serving as the, your moderator today. Uh, today's program is produced by Above the Law and by FOSA, the open source a company that, that provides open source management for enterprise teams. Uh, in, uh, in our usual uh, housekeeping announcements, let me just make clear that uh, you should see a Q&A box off on your uh, lower left-hand side of your screen. If you have a question, that's the place to put it in there. Um, and uh, the, I'm going to be, uh, we're going to, of course, save time for uh, questions and answers at the, at the end of the program, but I'm also going to be monitoring uh, question and answer box throughout the program. So if there's something uh, that you feel is pressing and that you want to ask it uh, uh, right away, go ahead and put it in there and I'll keep an eye on that as we go through the program. Uh, we'll get to introducing the panelists in just a second, but a little bit about uh, what to expect today. Uh, the Product Council serves a unique role in an enterprise, often serving as a bridge among a company's business technology and legal stakeholders. And while tech is often a central aspect of the Product Council's work, the role isn't necessarily limited to those with deep technical expertise. So today we're going to look a little bit more closely at exactly what is the role of the Product Council, and then talk about how one becomes a Product Council, and then finally dive a bit more into some of the tech and legal issues the Product Council is involved with. Uh, that's me. I'm the moderator. Uh, we've got a great panel here today. And uh, just to get everything started, I'm just going to go around and ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves and tell, uh, tell us a little bit about what they do. So Kate, uh, let's start with you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, so I was product counsel, and I came out of law school. Uh, for four years at VMware. I was lead product counsel at ServiceNow. Um, I run my own solo practice now, and I have a wide variety of clients uh, who require a lot of product work, but a lot of other things as well. And I'm really happy to join you. Great. And John, how about you? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is John Tsai. I work at Stripe right now. I, um, I'm, my official title is IP counsel. Um, I handle all matters of IP uh, patents. Uh, trade secrets, um, and I also act as product counsel to the open source team um, here at Stripe and the engineering team at Stripe. So, um, and I used to work uh, in a similar capacity at, at Facebook and, and PayPal. Really uh, look forward to the discussion today. Thanks, John. Uh, Oliver, next to you. Hi, everybody. I'm Oliver. Uh, I'm the head of legal at HelloSign. We were recently acquired by Dropbox about a year ago. Uh, and previous to this, I started my career a long time ago at Facebook and then joined a company called Optimizely that does uh, AV and web testing. And excited to talk to everybody today. And finally, Carlos. Hi, everyone. My name is Carlos Chung. Um, I'm part of the FOSA team over here. We work with a lot of in-house counsels as well as external counsels to run open source compliance. Um, we help with a lot of M&A work, um, IPO, and other things. So happy to be here. And uh, just to address one other housekeeping issue, which somebody just asked about. Yes, this, this is being recorded, and it will be available to uh, registrants after the fact uh, as well. Uh, so you will be uh, get a link to the recording after the, after the program is, is over. Um, so we want to launch into talking about what is the role of, of a product council, uh, a little bit more about what are the, the duties and responsibilities uh, of the job and, and kind of where it fits into the uh, both the, the legal department and, and the broader organization. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, Kate, not, not to keep picking on you first, but maybe, you know, since you, you've been in this role a couple of times, maybe you could kind of start by sharing uh, your thoughts on, on really what is the role of the Product Council? What did it look like for you? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I, I think Product Council very generally is responsible for getting products out the door. Um, and that can look different depending on what it is that the company makes, right? Um, you know, what you need to do to launch a software product, for example, may be a little bit different than what you have to do to launch a hardware product. 
but that's basically the main goal. And I think there are some things that are fairly familiar to people that come with that role, for example, writing terms of service or writing EULAs. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of the time is also spent buying technology that your company may use in order to put into the product. It may be spent on doing technical partnerships, uh, for example, with other companies that you want to collaborate with. Um, and it can also include a lot of things that are sort of just the glue that holds everything else together. Um, for a lot of product counsel, you may either have some privacy duties or you're working with outside counsel or you're working with a privacy department, for example. Um, you may be working with export compliance because you understand the product and you can explain to people what it does and how it functions. Um, so you also have a lot of sort of those kind of roles where you're really bringing together a lot of team members from across the company um, to, to help, you know, facilitate all the checks that need to go into place to get the product out. I'm curious, given that you held the role at a, at a couple of different companies, was it the same from one to another? I mean, how much does it kind of vary with where you are or the organization you're in? Well, I, I think it varies dramatically based on, you know, the size of the company itself and then the size and sophistication of the legal department. You know, there are some places where you are product counsel, but also you may be part-time commercial counsel, for example. Um, but there's other places where you're going to be one member of a product team that's, you know, hundreds of people, you know, and in that case, you, your role may be very specific. Um, you know, at VMware, for example, my role for a long time was very specific, right? I was dealing with open source specifically um, that we were using in our products um, and open source that we were putting out as open source products. Um, and that's a very kind of narrow definition. Um, and at ServiceNow, I was the first product counsel and I was doing everything um, and a lot of things that are not even in the product role. It sort of just depends on what the needs of the company are. I think it's very flexible um, depending on how you're resourced and staffed. Yeah. Uh, John, you're, you're at Stripe. How do you see, how do you see the role uh, uh, from, where, from where you are? Yeah, I think, um, I think at Stripe um, I, I kind of hold a, a slightly uh, interesting role because I'm partly a kind of domain name area expert, to, expert in IP, but I also act as kind of product counsel in some ways for the open source um, like program team here at Stripe, which is kind of very nascent and mostly made up of um, engineers and product managers that volunteer their time to do it um, because we don't have a formal um, kind of well, um, kind of dedicated open source team, but um, I think I think from my perspective and, and from seeing others at Stripe, it really is um, like uh, Kate said, a one-stop shop for uh, our our internal business and engineering teams. And Stripe is a very engineering uh, kind of driven company, as, as I know many other tech companies are. And so a lot of what um, the product council role is, uh, from my perspective, is uh, really handling the day-to-day. -day of those engineers and getting the product out and coordinating across all the different areas of uh, Stripe Legal. For example, we have a lot of regulatory, a lot of um, compliance, and a lot of other issues that come up. And sometimes the product council will be the primary point of contact for those things, but they will obviously get in touch with the right uh, subject matter experts and collate and condense all that information. So in some sense, they act as a um, you know, a manager, a product manager of that of that process and understanding how to get the product across the line. So they work really much hand in hand with um, the product teams to um, really just um, any roadblock that exists. Um, they they are the ones that are kind of handling it, and um, and um, so that's kind of how I see it uh, from my perspective at Stripe. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, Oliver, what about you? What, what about from your perspective? Uh, does, does, does what you've heard so far resonate with uh, what you understand the, the role to be? Yeah, so I think what Kate and John said makes a lot of sense. Uh, my main experience is usually earlier on in the company, so either being one of the first attorneys or one of the first group of attorneys. So I think that really changes how I see product counsel in the early days of company's life cycle. You often are not, you know, product counsel per se. You might be the first lawyer, and product counsel will just be a part of your job. And it'll change from company to company. For example, Facebook was very consumer focused, so the product counseling had to deal with a lot of consumer issues. 
uh, and today at HelloSign, we by the nature of our business are essentially a compliance product. So the product council actually is a much more expansive role than I think at your traditional tech company. Uh, product council at HelloSign is actually involved in developing the product alongside engineers and product managers. So it's not just about counseling, it's actually getting involved. I think if you work in other regulated industries like healthcare or financial services, it might be a more familiar role. It raises the question of, of, of at what point uh, in an organization, what, at what point of a company's growth does it does it need to be kind of a freestanding uh, position? <laughs> Is there an answer to that, Oliver? I mean, from what you've seen, uh, at what point does it need to kind of be broken off into a, a role of its own? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, really it's based on workload and the experience, <clears throat> I think, of the <clears throat> people in the roles. So it depends on how technical, I think there's a question about, you know, how technical the background, our backgrounds are. I don't have a technical background, so, you know, as we scaled up at Optimizely and at HelloSign, uh, the product and the role of product council became very much more technical. So I eventually, you know, hired people with better backgrounds than myself, but in the early days of just getting things up and running, <clears throat> it's not so important. But I think, you know, one is just workload based and what the company's focused on, and two is, uh, just really what you're looking for and what what the needs of the company are. Yeah, um, and uh, uh, Carlos, I just wanted to come to you. I, I, you're you're not a public a, a product council, but you're you're probably uh, see it from <laughs> from the other side in, in a sense. Uh, in in so far as you probably work with a lot of product council, I'm just wondering from from where you sit, what you see as the role or, or the value of the role to you. Yeah, at least for my. my I think, point of view, I work with a lot of in-house counsels as well as external counsels, and um, I think the one thing I see that might be happening more in the future, and I'm starting to, as we work with a lot of companies, is um, a lot of the product counsels are starting to become more data-driven. Um, I know that's like a cliche for a lot of the roles that we're seeing in different functions, but, um, you know, when we look at data privacy, it's getting really into, like, the data, and you have to analyze, like, how things are going in uh, through different, like, architectures. Um, same thing when we see like open source license compliance, like you have to understand like some of the architecture of how like how open source might be entering into your business. So like understanding the data streams um, as well. So I think some of the things that we might be seeing more in the future is just like how does it evolve uh, for the role itself to become more data oriented um, and using that in, into like your arguments or whatnot you might be doing for your actual functional role. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm curious just kind of where this role fits into the organization. I mean, do, do you sit squarely within the legal department? Do you, do you kind of cross, <laughs> cross borders, as, as it were, uh, within the organization between product groups and, and, and tech groups and, 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 and legal department? Uh, where, where, does the, where does the position kind of sit and, and uh, operate? Oh, I'll, I'll talk to that a little that? bit. Yeah, Kate. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah I, I think, I think it, you know, it obviously depends on how you know the legal department is structured. But I think in most places, you know, your day-to-day -day interactions are, are going to be almost exclusively with an engineering team or with sort of associated teams, right? Whether that's product or release management, depending on how you organize. But you're going to be spending most of your day talking to fairly technical people. Um, you know, you were part of a legal department, of course, but you know, your, your interactions with other lawyers are, are actually kind of small in comparison to how much time you spend with engineers talking to them about, you know, what they have developed, what they're planning to develop in the future, you know, walking through demos, um, looking at wireframes, you know, um, talking about, you know, where it's going and any regulatory issues that might come up or licensing issues or anything else that you have to be concerned with. Um, so, you know, you sit in legal, but you're really kind of an extension of that engineering group. And I think you have a particularly interesting view because as product counsel, you you really get to see, you know, the, the 5,000 foot view. You get to see what, what the business teams are doing likely across the entire company. You can see, you know, you can see things that other people can't see because you can see where you know, teams are both working on the same thing but maybe don't know about it, you know, or they have, you know, different approaches to the same sort of problem. So a lot of times you're, you're sort of the, the engineering go-between, and a lot of times you're, you're messaging things from one side of engineering to another. Um, 
And I would also say that, you know, one interesting thing about the role is that, at least for me, I find that it involves a lot of project management. In fact, probably more project management and operational work than even legal work. Um, because you have to meet with so many people, you have to take in so many ideas, you have to remember, you know, which stakeholder is responsible for which decision. Um, and a lot of times what you're working on is process. Right? Like, if you want to get something out the door or you want to create a new UO, who do I even talk to in the company? Um, yeah. Uh, great. That makes sense. Uh, Oliver and John, what about uh, what's your, uh, what are your thoughts on that and sort of where you fit, uh, where the job, where the role of product counsel fits within the organization? Uh, so that's a great question. question. <clears throat> Bob, and yeah. yeah, it's Oliver. Um, yeah, I think in the early days that both Optimizely and HelloSign, uh, my role, I sat on the management team just because of the hierarchy of the company. But as it scales out, it really is something that if you build out a larger legal team, will squ sit squarely within the legal team. And I echo Kate's points of it really is a, a role and a function that operates mostly where you're working day to day with mostly engineers and product managers and a lot of the skills there you know, you rely on your core legal skills, but a lot of it is actually project management. So how do you, as part of the core team responsible for shipping a product, do it, you know, on time, on schedule, but also in compliance with all the various regulations that are applicable to your business line. So I think that's pretty interesting, but I typically see it in the legal department itself. Yeah. Yeah. John, any further thoughts on it? Yeah. This is John. Yeah, this is John. Um, yeah, I think it, um, I think it evolves over time and, like to Oliver and Kate's points, I think it um, it can start as any role really within within legal. Like I know that at Stripe um, before a formal product team was really kind of uh, kind of created, it was kind of split like between regulatory sometimes and and commercial because some of the commercial folks just had to get involved when they were trying to do deals to release products that they were just getting more and more involved with the products and just naturally became the point of contact for the engineering or product teams. Um, sometimes it was the regulatory team because they were trying to launch a new product or a new, you know, in a new area or, um, and, and they were trying to get that information from the regulatory side to see if they could do it or what, what they needed to do in order to comply with the local regulations. So, um, I think it kind of naturally evolved out of kind of who was the first point of contact within legal that they go to, and if they have a good experience, they kind of keep going back to them. And then at some point it became too, you know, the, the bandwidth became too much where it made sense to kind of centralize it within a separate team within legal. But I think that's usually how I see it evolve. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to jump ahead just because, uh, as Oliver pointed out, we have a we have a question. We don't want to be accused of deceptive marketing for this panel. I mean, the title of this webinar is the question says, "Is being a product counsel even if you're not technical?" So the the question was, uh, I'm curious about the speaker's technical background or lack thereof, and how they scaled up this knowledge in their in their roles. Uh, Kate, what about you? What kind of technical background, if any, did you have, and how did you get to have the knowledge that you needed for your for your role? Sure. So I don't have an engineering degree. I actually have a finance degree undergrad. Um, so I, you know, would not would not say that I'm officially technical. But when I was in high school, I learned how to program. Uh, when I was in college, I worked IT for four years. Um, when I was in law school, I really went all out on IP courses. I probably took everything that we had, um, including patents, advanced patents, and all that. Um, and I think, you know, certainly a lot of my knowledge was augmented by what I learned on the job, right? Um, you really learn a lot by meeting with engineers, talking with engineers, and that never ends, right? I, you know, there's always new technologies, there's n always new ways of doing things, new tools, um, new ways of thinking, and so you're always learning on the job, you're always learning from people, and it's really important to build good relationships with technical people that you feel like can explain things to you in a way that you understand. Um, um, because you'll be going back to them again and again. Um, so, you know, a lot of what I've learned has definitely been on the job. And then, and then I guess it sounds like part of it is, is knowing the right people to ask when you don't know the answer. 
Absolutely, and, and not being embarrassed to ask, right? Um, you know, as you get better at the product counsel role, you, you really start to be able to translate things well. Like, you know, you understand enough of what engineers say to understand how that, you know, impacts, you know, the legal side of things, um, and you really become the go-between. You can really answer the questions that your general counsel, for example, has about certain, you know, projects, in a way that nobody else can because you can really do that translational work between the engineers and the lawyers. Yeah. John, what about you? What kind of technical background or lack thereof uh, did you have? Yeah, so um, I'm probably not the poster child for this, um, <laughs> for, for, this uh, <laughs> for this specific slide, I guess, because I, I do have a, um, a, a computer science degree. Um, but I will say that a lot of Product counsel. The, the vast majority of product counsel that I know at at Stripe in a lot of my previous um, positions at you know at, at PayPal and, and Facebook, they were not uh, people were not technical, uh, and I don't think that's a prerequisite in any way. Means uh, the vast majority of them were not. Um, but I'll mention Sarah Harrington, who's the head of kind of legal head of our products um, team. She she was a tech trans partner at Wilson and she didn't have a technical background and she was at LinkedIn for a long time uh, and, and took them public and and she uh, you know she's one of the more most technical people that I know in terms of um, kind of getting in the details and understanding what's going on and so I don't think you need to have a technical background in order to do the job I do think it requires um, an aptitude of or not an aptitude but a willingness to really learn and um, roll up your sleeves and really dig in and, and understand and you know, when you first join a product or a, a company, it probably is like drinking out of the fire hose for the first couple of months to understand really what's going on and get your grips around things. But I think it, it really just takes a willingness to understand that. And I think sometimes it even helps if you maybe don't have a technical background because I think it uh, it helps in your role in the, in the sense of you're translating between kind of legal and technical because that's your job really to translate like the legal requirements down into what is it net out like in the product, what do we need to change, what do we need to do, and so I think having a non-technical background can really help with kind of translating between the two sides, as long as you're willing to kind of understand the technical details to the extent that you need to for the position, uh, for the for the specific issue you have. So. Thanks, John. And Oliver, I know you alluded briefly to this before, but do you have anything uh, further to say uh, about what, you, what, you, what your own technical background was, or, or really what you think it needs to be for this position? Yeah, so I don't have a technical background at all. I was a political science and economics uh, major in college, and I don't know how to code. I took uh, I took one computer science class in high school, and it was called C++ for U++, and I got a C++ in it. So that was probably not <laughs> not not in my future. I don't think it's required at all. Uh, I think what is really important to be a product counsel is passion for the product and for technology in general. So, you know, I don't think you need to know how to code, but when talking to engineers, if you don't really understand how technology works or, for example, what an API is, that's really a big disadvantage. But that's not, those things don't require a technical background per se. It requires, you know, doing some research and understanding how technology works in general. I think that, in my opinion, is more important. And then showing a passion for the particular product that you're working on is also really important. If you have the best technical background, you understand how everything works, but you just don't care. Uh, that's a big problem and big obstacle to becoming a great product counsel. Yeah, uh, you, you've just you just kind of alluded to this, but I, I, I'm wondering, uh, uh, Kate, perhaps if you could talk about what you, you see as maybe some of the, you know, the soft skills or, or the other kinds of qualities besides technical background that might make uh, uh, make for a, a good uh, product counsel. Well, I think. You know, you always see these job descriptions that, you know, describe you as a self-starter and highly motivated legal ninja, right? And this is the sort of stuff that makes <laughs> you roll your eyeballs. Um, but there is a little grain of truth in that because a lot of times if you're hired as product counsel, you're, you're hired explicitly because nobody else in the legal department understands the engineers. Um, <laughs> so you, you, you really do um, – have you know a, a unique role and a unique position in, in trying to understand what is happening with the product and really explaining that to the rest of the team. Um, you know, 
as a good product counsel, you know, you'll, you'll find yourself actually interfacing with, you know, for example, your commercial legal team a lot because the commercial legal team will come to the point where they're doing some negotiations, a touch on some technical aspects of the product. They're not really in a position, you know, to understand, you know, exactly how to change the contract or how to redline things or, or, you know, what product feature is being talked about. And so you really try and explain things well um, to that commercial team and well enough that they can negotiate confidently. So there's, there's a lot of training involved. There's a lot of education involved. And some of it is, you know, to your own legal members, obviously. Um, and obviously, you know, on the other side to the engineers as well, right? As part of my product role and, it, you know, everywhere I've been, including as outside counsel, you know, I've always done engineering engineering trainings as well, where you're talking to them about basic IP P issues, you're talking to them about open source, you're, you're talking to them about how to interact with legal, what it is legal wants from them. Um, so I think you have to, I think you have to like teaching people. I think you have to, you know, like presenting. I think you have to be okay with public speaking. Um, I think those are some of the soft skills that, that I rely on a lot. Uh, it sounds like a jack of all trades. So, so, uh... Carlos, I wonder from from uh, in your role at, at FOSA, what what you see uh, or what you've seen in terms of some of the skills that are, are most useful for uh, those who serve in the role of product counsel. Yeah, um, for a lot of the product counsel that we worked with, um, and we we worked with some of our customers today are like Uber, Twitter, um, a lot of folks in San Francisco, but also folks that we worked with. Uh, across like legacy companies as well, um, like CBRE and Ford Motor. Um, for a lot of those companies that we work with, I think there's a balance between under depending on what product you're serving. Um, so I think some of the hard hardships with other companies and roles is if you have to deal with uh, products that are also hardware and software, um, and understanding some of the nuances between um, the ties between hardware and software. And I think that gets really hard because I think there's a lot more um, different like regulations and compliance for hardware, but we're seeing on uplift for software as well. Um, so I think the different paradigms is really good to know, especially if you're going into one of those types of companies where you're doing a span of both. And o over the years to come, I think we're seeing an expansion of like IoT and obviously autonomous vehicles. So there's becoming this intersection of like hardware and software and understanding kind of the legal ramifications for both like hardware and software is uh, I think a kind of interesting prospect. Yeah. Uh, maybe one other question on, on this, on this uh, topic of becoming a product counsel is kind of the, the, the route into the job. Uh, I, I, is, it, uh, is it best to kind of start in-house and, and work your way into this job? Is it, is it best to come from a law firm? Is there any right way uh, into this role? Uh, Oliver, what have you seen on that? Uh, yeah, so I actually never worked at a law firm, uh, so <laughs> I guess my perspective is it's not a requirement. I think to my previous point, yeah. if you're interested in technology or in, this, in the industry you're in, I think that's the most important thing. And generally, it's a lot of on-the-job learning. <clears throat> so, you know, at a lot of early-stage companies, you may not be a product counsel per se, but to John and Kate's points, you just kind of start interacting with engineers, figuring out how the product works, and they'll ask you legal questions as they become you know, as your product or your service needs uh, more counseling. So I, I think that tends to work well. I don't think the law firm background hurts. I think especially these days, you know, a lot of the product counsel role overlaps a bit with privacy. So it's because sometimes you see like a crossover between product, privacy, and commercial, all three at once. And I think those are becoming more core functions to <clears throat> legal departments. Bigger ones will often have separate roles, but at a smaller company, you'll probably play the hat of you know one or more of those roles all at once. So you know if you are a product counsel and you have a deep interest in privacy law, you can get experience that way. Or if you've done outside counsel work in privacy, that's all for them a great way to get introduced to companies. They may not have a product specific question per se, but they'll have a question about you know how does their product meet or comply with a certain privacy law GDPR. I know that was a big thing in 2018, so a lot of people, you know, got knowledge through that and then became shifted a little bit from privacy product or still hold dual roles, dual roles today. Yeah, I mean that was in fact one of the questions we've we've, we've had uh, here, uh, which says that the job postings for product counsel seem to require CCPA and GDPR as well as knowledge of regulations 
for the particular product. Uh, and what are what are the panelists' thoughts on that? Uh, you, you seem yeah, to be uh, kind of confirming. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I I think that's definitely right. So so one way to think about this is you know as as product counsel, you're in charge of everything that goes into the product, right? So all the technology that you might buy, as well as all the technologies you might integrate with. And so if you have a software product, for example, that's a software as a service product um, offering, um, if that product then interacts with another SaaS, um, you've got data going between the two. Uh, whatever agreement that you've got with that other company, especially if there's some sort of partnership or something like that, um, it's going to touch on data. Um, even the most basic things that a company does, for example, you know, like they hire, for example, web analytics companies to tell you who's visiting the site and maybe try and match up, you know, give you information about the people, where are they coming from, who are they, what are they interested in. Again, that involves data. There's, you know, there's very few technology agreements that I handle these days that don't involve data in some way, shape, or form. And so, you know, you're you're going to, there's, there's no way around it, you're going to be negotiating data processing agreements and you really do need to understand GDPR and, GDPR and CCPA and other privacy and data regulations around the world if you're going to have this role. Um, and it's actually a really big change because I think, you know, 10 years ago, privacy was this very, very niche kind of area and very few people did it. Um, you know, people, people in that area were actually really, really hard to find. And nowadays, I, I think it's very difficult um, to have a product counsel role or even a commercial role um, at a tech company if you don't have some background in privacy. It's one of the big changes that I've seen um, during my career. Thanks, Kate. Uh, anybody else want to comment on that on that question? John, do you have anything on that? Yeah, yeah this is yeah, this is John. Um, I 100% agree that privacy is just becoming a bigger and bigger aspect of um, of the product legal role, I think, uh, whether it's consumer facing or not, there's a lot of uh, privacy concerns at all at all companies. You know, at, at Facebook, obviously, it was, a, it was a primary thing that most product counsel had to kind of spot and fix or uh, spot and raise issues for privacy, like as a first kind of line of defense. I think at Stripe, which is a more of a B2B company, it's the same thing. Like, most of our product councils have some basic kind of understanding and knowledge of GDPR and are able to kind of answer all the basic questions that they would need in order to kind of advise product teams and then they will escalate to the, the privacy legal team if there are kind of more pressing matters or more specific nuances that they don't quite understand or know. But um, they're kind of expected to be the first line of defense and really kind of triage and handle all the lower risk or kind of more common questions that you would get in terms of um, in terms of what privacy uh, rules there are and those types of things. So I 100% agree that's been a big change that I've seen in the last, let's say, three, three years or so. And, and a slightly related question, somewhat related question, uh, also from from uh, the audience, is, is whether anyone can provide examples of how they interact with information security, risk management in their role, uh, or best practices for integration of legal with security. Is that something anybody wants to speak to? Yeah, Bob, this is Oliver. So I think it, that is a yeah. really important functionality, and not just product counsel, but the legal and security departments in general need to interact closely together. So I'll just give some examples. Uh, you know, at HelloSign, when we were getting our various compliance certifications, SOC 2, ISO 27001, uh, basically the teams work together to put in place a plan. I think that's important because it's really the cooperation between the two of knowing, you know, <clears throat> how the systems work. It's kind of important for both departments to know how the products work, how data flows work, and then uh, not only to ensure you get those compliances, but that you have the right you know, legal terms or filings that you may need to do to uh, show that you actually comply with those and then show to customers. So on one hand, you know, security teams don't generally love interacting with our customers directly. Uh, so we interact with the security team, sort of play middlemen there and really help distill down a lot of that information uh, when we talk with our customers' business teams. And then the security team, if they need to, can interact directly with our customer security team. That typically uh, has been a successful process, but it's not like that at all companies. 
Yeah, I, I would say that generally um, security is product counsel's best friend. Um, a lot of times when product counsel sits down and, you know, watches a demo of a new product or, you know, needs an architectural, you know, explanation, um, they'll bring someone from security with them or security will bring legal with them um, because you're both taking in the same information. Um, you're both, answer, you're lots of times asking similar questions um, and you both have a, have a similar functional role, right? You're, you're both trying to reduce risk for the company and you're both very interested in making sure that things Things that need to be reviewed actually get reviewed before they go out the door. Um, so a lot of times, you know, security is looping me in because they're hearing about something for the first time and they think I should hear about it, um, and vice versa. Um, and so if you if you have a friend in security, um, that that is ex extremely valuable for product counsel. Thanks. Any other comments on that? Yeah. So uh, I think I'll yeah. say. Oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry. Just, just quickly. Um, I think on on my side, I, I deal with security quite a bit on 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 open source, and I agree that um, like with with what Kate and Kate and Oliver said, that that they're often your best friend and have a partner. Um, at at Stripe, security is a huge kind of first order uh, team, right? And they 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 have a lot of say just because our our business requires a lot of. Um, you know, uh, trust with our customers and their their financial instruments and things don't get compromised. And so um, oftentimes they have more clout than legal or other teams in terms of kind of uh, getting things done. And so oftentimes I will partner with them and almost draft off their, uh, their priorities because they have similar priorities to legal in terms of kind of protecting things and making sure that there's um, no greater risk than necessary to put a product out. And so I, I often work with them, especially on the open source side, to kind of that um, third-party open source and other software that's coming in the company, and um, they have a lot of tools that can help me with that. So I actually utilize a lot of their tools to help me with my day-to-day -day, um, job. So um, I think security is a great partner. Great, thanks, John. Um, moving on to some of the technology and legal uh, issues. Uh, are there are there tools tools of the trade, so to speak, uh, that that product counsel tend to use technology tools that you tend to use in your day to day work? Um, Kate, what about you? Is there anything in particular? Sure. So you know, for me, most of the tool tooling question comes in actually with respect to open source. So you know, one of the things that has really um, changed in the last you know 15 years is the explosion of how much open source technology companies use, um, whether that's strictly internally or that they put in their products. Um, you know, I would say that you know any company that ships a large product these days is probably using a thousand pieces of open source or more. Um, and in fact, I would say that you know of what they ship, you know, ninety percent of the code that they're shipping was not written by them. You know, only ten percent is actually written by the company. Everything else is you know either open source or other other code that they license from third parties. And so, Understanding that, understanding that you know your own IP is really just the very tip of the iceberg, um, you have to figure out how to go through the other 90%. You have to figure out, you know, do we have a license for this? If we do have a license, what are the restrictions? How do we comply? Um, and how do we make sure that we have ongoing compliance? And that's where a lot of tooling for me comes in. Um, so one of the first pieces of tooling that that comes to mind is open source scanning. So being able to look at a product um, with a tool to see what's in it. Um, obviously, for me, the the number one tool that I use is FASA. Um, that is by far the most popular tool amongst my clients for doing open source scanning. Um, because they really focus on the day-to-day -day compliant nature of compliance. They really help people, you know, get products ready for launch, whereas I feel like a lot of the other tools are, you know, they're useful for M&A, but they're not as useful for day-to-day -day work. So yeah, I do use FASA a lot, uh, mostly driven by decisions of my clients. Um, but I've used other things. I've used Palomita or their Flexera now. I've used Black Duck. Um, so that's one piece of it. Um, the other piece of it is tooling to then deal with the results that you get. So a lot of times 
you will find that a particular package has a problem, you need it fixed. So how do, how, do you, how do you message that to engineers, and then how do you make sure it gets fixed? Usually that's a ticketing system, so something like JIRA. Um, and so I've used a whole bunch of different ones, and I've designed a whole, designed a whole bunch of workflows for these different ticketing systems. Um, that's where that's actually the other piece where it comes in really handy to to be a little bit technical because you are working with so many tools and you do have to think really hard about how to configure them um, and how they're going to work together. And so that's another piece where you you really have to love the technology. So that's probably the number one area for me. Yeah, and I, I know we've got a we've got a couple of slides here that can go into a little bit more detail on on open source management. Um, and before we get to that, let me just check uh, with, with John and Oliver. Is there anything else you wanted to mention in terms of kind of the tools that you're using uh, or, the, or the product uh, council are using in their day-to-day -day work that you're seeing? Yeah, Bob, this is Oliver. So I, I think uh, in product council, the open source aspect is important, and we'll get to that later. But I think a lot of it is also like data mapping and diagramming. So we tend to use what our engineering teams use, and that's a combination of I think, you know, Jira is great, Zendesk for ticketing, those type of things, but also Figma, that's really great for designers and allows us to easily, like, kind of diagram how our data flows are happening. I think that's getting more and more important, especially with the overlapping privacy laws. And then, you know, in workflow products, there's tons of different ones. We use an in-house one that we call HelloWorks, and that allows us to basically intake a lot of the you know, matters that we have to work with uh, in our product teams without having to, like, open a full JIRA ticketing, uh, for example. And those are really great if engineers just want, you know, quick answers on easy questions to do without having to go through, like, a whole development cycle. So I think those type of tools are really important, and it's really important not just to, you know, implement something in legal, but ensure it's aligned with what your engineering and product teams are doing. So being able to cross-functionally use them, I see as a big win for everybody. Thanks. John, anything else on that? Yeah, I think um, I think besides, like setting aside the open source, I think Carlos will probably go in a little more detail, uh, and I think it's important. Um, I think I think using I think what Oliver said about using what your customers are using is really important, or what your clients are using in terms of the, the engineering uh, and product teams are using. I think that's um, really kind of key and important. Um, at Stripe, we use a wide variety of of tools to communicate and to kind of get things across, including some kind of design tools, sometimes just uh, a shared Google Doc or something like that uh, works. And so it's really kind of up to the, what, what the product team is really into um, for their specific area that we kind of uh, play to what they what they want us to do. So um, I think that's kind of my, my comment on that. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, Carlos, we, we've teed it up for you because <laughs> uh, we'd love to uh, have you talk a little bit more about uh, open source compliance and, and technology behind that. Um, so uh, if you want to pick that up, and then we'll get to uh, Q&A. Yeah. That sounds great. Um, I'll take only a few minutes on this, and then I would really love to move to questions. I see a lot of great questions um, out there, so we'd love to answer them. Um, can we jump to the next slide? So just overall, some things that we're seeing in the industry is just how open source is starting to become a kind of standard. Um, and kind of the analogy that I like to give for people to think about this is think about all the stuff that you've started seeing in hardware. So like, you know, previously when we think about automotive and, you know, maybe when the first car was built, when you first built like maybe Ford vehicle, um, I think Ford, you know, they spent all their time sourcing all the raw materials themselves, putting it together just one car at a time. Um, and then afterwards, they built the assembly line, and then afterwards, they realized that with the assembly line, they shouldn't be sourcing all the materials themselves. They should be sourcing it from other partners. And that's kind of the same aspect that we see in software. So today, you're not necessarily taking, you're not building all the open source, you're not building all the software yourself as a proprietary manager. You're sourcing all the open source so software and putting it into your supply chain. So when you think about open source as supply chain, similar to hardware, and uh, building these cars where the raw materials, and you have a supply chain for that raw material, uh, you're starting to incur a lot of this liability and you're thinking about, okay, like how do I optimize my supply chain? And that's really much a, um, I would say, engineering architecture function, but also a legal function to think about. Um, and one of the things that I think is about to happen in the next few years 
is the stuff that you get when you buy an Xbox. You know, an Xbox you get like the specifications in that little packet um, that you usually throw away and recycle, where it tells you all your warranty, your liabilities, what's all the specifications uh, with the Xbox that you're buying. Uh, we think we're going to see the same thing for software, where whatever software you buy, you're going to get all the specifications of it, um, telling you everything that you're actually purchasing and being more transparent about that. And so we're seeing this push across the industry, where it's coming from NTIA, FDA, um, as well as like other folks that are pushing uh, for a standardization, like ISO standard for this year. Um, so get ready to see that. I think it's going to be really interesting for that piece. And then. I think the next slide, we kind of talk about some of the ways that you can support it as like a product council. Um, so as you're working through for a product council, these are some of the activities that you can perform um, and do as you think about it and uh, study up on it um, as we're making this transition to really think about the supply chain. And then the la I think the next last slide before we get into Q&A here, um, there's some ways that we do help uh, with a lot of our customers. Um, so some of the customers that we work with today, Uber, Verizon, Sendesk, uh, we've also done a few acquisitions, um, M&A and IPO, IPO type of activities that we assisted with. Um, but I think the three major areas that we can help with is like just automate the inventory and understanding what you're getting, um, then applying dynamic policies so you don't actually spend a lot of time on this, and then third, um, just helping you re produce the reports that are need to stay compliant. Um, so these are some things that we work with. and. Uh, I'm happy to take any other questions around this in a later point, but today's focus is more about the product council itself, so I'd love to kind of jump into the Q&A. Great. Thanks, Carlos. Does anybody want to comment on anything that, that, that Carlos just said, or should we move right into the Q&A? So we, we've got a lot of uh, hearing on. <laughs> we've got a, definitely got a bunch of questions here. Uh, and one of them is, is actually a couple of people have asked sort of a similar question, which is basically, uh, in what in what types of companies do you see product council? Or is it pretty much just tech companies? Somebody else mentioned, you know, do you see anything like healthcare, or pharma, life sciences companies? So, so where do we find this role? Anybody can take that. Yeah, Bob, that's a great question. It's all over. Uh, not working with those companies directly, but when we you know sell to them or partner with them, oftentimes the role of product council is taken either by privacy council, they might have an explicit privacy council, or like a regulatory compliance council. So I think, you know, the the specification of, you know, what, what goes into the role of product council is often found across a variety of, you know, job titles. So I wouldn't look at the job title specifically, but really what role do they play in those companies? I think they do exist, and it may not be a product council proper title, but definitely when we talk with our counterparts of those companies, they have people who are doing the similar things that we're doing at tech companies. Yeah, I, I think industry-wise, you know, I mostly see it in software, hardware, and life sciences. I mean, basically anywhere where the underlying, where the product, you know, has IP, right, where there's something about the product that is copyrighted or it's patented or it's trademarked, right, that's where you have a product role. And then, you know, the nature of the product really determines the nature of that product role. You know, some things are going to be very regulatory heavy, right? So if you're, if you're, in, if you're in healthcare and you're making, like, devices, that go into people's bodies, it's going to be, you know, your product role is going to be much less about IP per se and much more about FDA approvals, right, and seeking approvals from around the world and sort of understanding the regulatory approval structure. Um, so the, the product really drives, you know, the nexus of, of what you do. All right, thanks. Um, so many good questions here. I don't know where to start. Uh, uh, what about this of, of uh, what – what technology processes would the panel recommend for product council teams to track knowledge on how they advise on certain products? For example, I find similar issues come up from time to time across our product council group, and I'm curious how to create an opportunity for the product team to assess previous, to access rather, previous decisions, council, et cetera. Anybody have any thoughts on that? This is uh, this is John. I think um, uh, on this on the on how we approach it at Stripe, I think the um, uh, we kind of have a bias towards a lot of written communications. I think that kind of comes down from uh, Patrick and John being our founders and kind of liking the written word and appreciating uh, folks that write well. Uh, it, it can sometimes get in the way of kind of moving fast, but I think it also kind of 
um, underscores how, as a company, we really try to build to, to scale. And so I think a lot of what we think about even early on in a, in a, in a product life cycle or in uh, evolution of a product team or a product council team is kind of how do we build for scale. And so a lot of what that involves is kind of creating documents that might outline not they may start by outlining kind of a specific issue that comes up uh, for a specific product, but then can be more generalized or shared with other product council. Um, uh, we don't we don't use any fancy like document management system or anything. A lot of it is just um, G docs that are then um, the the team kind of knows where they're stored and or shared with the whole team so that everyone can have access to it. Um, and so I, I think it really is more of a working model and less of a kind of technology, like um, kind of like we need a certain technology. It's much more of a everyone kind of buys into kind of the working model of how do we share information and something that, um, and when we create product briefs or things about decisions that are made that are huge, we often write those down and create a, like a one pager so that it can be kind of uh, memorialized for the future for others. Um, that's kind of how we do it at Stripe, I guess. Thanks, John. K Kate and Oliver, anything further on that? No, I think that. Uh, yeah, I would really, you know, I really agree with John that a lot of it's just the working model. We also do like formal product reviews, which I think is similar to what John's speaking about one pagers. But I think in addition to that, it's really important to assign ownership. So, you know, for every product that we have, we essentially have somebody who's the owner of that on the legal side and is responsible, the primary driver of that, and then documenting the functionality of that along with engineering to so their counterparts. So assigning those owners and responsible individuals has proven really helpful for us so then people know to, who to go to if they have a question that's not documented yet or if it's something in process. Uh, or, you know, we try to be pretty organized. <laughs> I think sometimes every company is a little bit disorganized and you know, where knowledge is kept. So the that kind of model is really important for us. All right, thanks. Um, a question, another question is, how often does a product council deal with regulatory issues, uh, especially if it's uh, a financial technology, a financial technology product? So how often do you deal with regulatory issues? Uh, uh, I think uh, this is John. Uh, I guess I'll speak since it's, um, uh, we deal with regulatory issues quite a, quite a bit. Like that's probably the first thing that anyone asks if they're trying to release a product. Um, I think one big uh, one big thing that Stripe's been trying to do is really build for international scope and scale, and trying to leverage and enable international uh, every single kind of international market that we could possibly get into. Um, and I think a lot of the regulatory issues come up in, the, in those contexts. For, for example, um, you know, we're, we're in something like, I think last count is uh, 50 or 60 or so countries. And so, um, but uh, a lot of the times, for example, um, the, the products are designed for a local, uh, a local view, for example, like if you're in Hong Kong, you're a Hong Kong company, or let's just say you're a, maybe you're a US company, but you're looking to get customers in, in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, ideal is a local uh, payment method that is very popular, probably like 80% 80, 80 of the Dutch day-to-day uh, -day, uh, commerce flows through ideal, not through credit cards or anything else. But um, how do you enable like a US-based company that is US-focused to accept um, payments uh, in the Netherlands using ideal for, um, net, uh, for Dutch customers, right? So like, um, and that turns out to be a more, much more complicated question than you would expect. Um, and, and every time you add a new market, um, it's not like you just press a button and then um, somehow an, uh, like a Hungarian uh, consumer can purchase from a U.S.-based store. There's a lot of kind of complexities of regulatory kind of cross-functioning between the different jurisdictions that you have to kind of net out on. And so, um, but I think the goal at Stripe is really to like, abstract all the all, all that away into an API so that the end user and uh, doesn't have to worry about that stuff but it, it's, it can get pretty complicated thanks John uh, on, on the open source issue somebody's asking uh, the question given the fact that open source software often has a near infinite web of dependencies 
how far does an organization's liability extend? First order, second order, third, et cetera. Anybody want to tackle that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to give legal advice, so I'll preface it with that. Um, but I will say that generally speaking, you know, a company is responsible for everything it ships. And so if it's in the product, you're responsible for it. All right. Anybody else want to comment? Any further thoughts on that? Good. Um, um, I yeah, I mean, yeah. I I think tying to another question I saw earlier um, about hardware and software related, kind of right. like related. Can to you give an example of a hardware and software product question that required you to bridge both types of technology? Yeah, and I think um, it's kind of a yeah, so tied to that question as well as like first order for second order. Um, I think the if you're shipping a hardware, I think the scrutiny is a lot higher. Um, so a lot of times it becomes on like what type of hardware you're shipping um, and what who's the person actually consuming it and which countries are actually consuming it. So we see a lot of, um, I think, hardware scrutiny more in, I think, uh, Japan as well as like in the Nordic or in Germany. Um, the scrutiny is a lot higher. Um, and then we see a lot more law cases in, I would say, those two countries as well. Um, so if you're doing anything hardware software related, I think understanding that is really important um, and understanding your supply cha chain because they're a lot more critical for everything. So even with infinite, um, if you're like, for instance, if you're selling that hardware software to an enterprise business, uh, we usually often get asked for everything that we're doing. Um, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter basically um, how far down it goes. They want to know everything that they're actually purchasing from you because if they're running it on their network, um, like you're shipping an on-prem software, um, or even if you're shipping hardware and software, they want to know what they're actually getting. Um, I think the other things to take into account for hardware and software is the difference between like operating system versus application. Um, so like embedded software um, is a lot different than I would say running SaaS or anything on the cloud. Um, so understanding two archetypes is uh, very, very important for kind of hardware and software. Um, I think other things we see in, I think, Kate or all of our other folks can speak more into is um, the rise in terms of like anything AI or cryptography related, um, anything that is distributing for hardware, that's all obviously uh, related to trade. And some I see that quite often for some companies as well in terms of like cryptography. Yeah, and there actually was a question as to whether, I'm not sure it was a question, just any experience in handling AI related algorithms and issues related to bias, which uh, Exactly what you were just saying, Carlos. But anybody want to follow up on what Carlos just said, or or on the AI question? Got just a couple minutes left here. All right. Uh, I wonder. We do have a couple more questions, but I wonder if if it might make sense to just kind of go around. Since since this, since this is a, a webinar about uh, becoming a product counsel, uh, we've all talked a, a lot about your your experience uh, in, in, in working in that role and working with that role. Uh, I wonder if we might just quick do a quick go around for final thoughts on, on any advice you might want to give to somebody who is looking to move into that role. Uh, and, uh, and then we can wrap it up with that. So Kate, how about you? Can we start with you? Sure. So I, I think for people who are still in law school, you know, if you're looking to get into this role, uh, definitely take all your IP classes. You know, make sure you really understand copyrights, patents, trademarks, trade secrets, all that. Um, and then contracting. You know, you're, a large part of this role is really going to be contracts and contract negotiations. So, you know, those are great. That's a great uh, background for this. Um, I would say, you know, for people who are already out of law school, people who are already in the legal practice, um, I do think it's easier to become product counsel once you're already in-house in some way. So, you know, if you have to transition to be a commercial counsel and then from there transition to product, I think that's okay. And I think that probably makes more sense because, like we said, you know, the, the product counsel role like really has to do a lot with operations and really has to do a lot of a lot of project management which may not be experience that you have as outside counsel um, but I think it's easier to grow into that role once you're already in-house than to necessarily jump straight to it um, from outside counsel um, but I think you know 
especially if you go to a smaller company, the needs are going to be flexible and they're going to grow and change. And I think if you show interest and aptitude into something, you know, you if you start doing the work of the role, you, you will eventually have the role. Sounds good. Uh, John, how about you? Uh, words of advice? Yeah, I think I think there's uh, the product council role is still still evolving, and I don't. I think there are some common backgrounds that people have that may get into it, but I, I don't think that there's a certain kind of profile that's prerequisite uh, for doing that. I, I think some of our product council were like, you know, one was a one was a IP litigator before, one was. Um, you know, doing um, regulatory work. Um, so it's just not not one kind of um, profile or or specific kind of background. So I wouldn't exclude myself depending on that. Having said that, I think um, having some background in in the various aspects that um, Ken mentioned uh, in in IP and contracting and privacy, I think is is very helpful. And um, kind of having a, a, a kind of even even a base layer of knowledge that then you can rely on uh, is, I think, uh, really important to be able to speak intelligently at a high level about some of these different topics that come up. All right, and uh, Oliver, what are your uh, final words of advice here? Yes, I would agree with everything that Kate and John said, and I think just looking forward to the future, like privacy, those type of regulations are gonna become a lot more important so not only knowing the current law, but also having a good pulse or even a strong viewpoint on you know what's going to happen in the future, I think is going to be important for uh, strong product counseling as uh, you know companies develop their products. It's not only trying to help you know what what how can we meet the regulations for today, but you know where do we see things going? So for example, in privacy GDPR, now we have CCPA, a push for national you know privacy regulation in the United States. It's really important to bring that viewpoint to a company. It'd be really hard to be a product counsel at a company that says, you know, we want to comply with these things, but we also don't value privacy inherently. So <laughs> that's probably a little bit of a mismatch, and you know, I think important uh, for even if you're a starting attorney or you know, not still in law school, or if you're very practiced, to bring that to any company you go to. Thank you, Oliver. And uh, Carlos, do you have any uh, final words of advice? You get the you get the last word here. <laughs> uh, a little bit different from my angle. Um, what I've seen some of the best yeah. product counsel or counsel that I've worked with in the past is um, having like an allies committee. Um, in those, I think when you think of when I think about it, I think more about it as a program management type of initiative. But having the right type of allies is uh, very critical. I think one important ally that we don't really talk about, um, but that can actually streamline your effort in understanding things, is um, enterprise architecture team or the architect architecture team. Um, sometimes if you're a smaller company, you might not have that, but you might have an engineer that thinks really thoroughly about architecture. Um, they're going to be your best friend. They're going to be your best friend on the technical front because they'll actually be able to walk through like the data model, how things are coming from the different angles. Um, one other framework I would recommend studying, um, if, especially if you're doing web app applications or things like that, is um, the basics of like model views control or the MVC model. Um, that's a good framework that I typically use on my day to day to think about kind of legal and like data privacy type of workflow when I'm working with our customers and clients. Thanks a lot, Carlos. Um, we had, a, we had a, a handful of questions here that we didn't get to, uh, and I want to let those people who pose those questions know that we will follow up uh, directly with them and, and try and get answers to them from the panelists. So if you didn't get your question answered on air, uh, expect, uh, expect to hear from us. Uh, uh, by email, and uh, we'll follow up with you. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, FOSA for uh, sponsoring today's webinar and uh, Above the Law for uh, helping to produce and get it all organized. And a, a huge thanks to our panelists for uh, really interesting uh, insights and presentation today. So thanks to all of you for being here today.